Can working out improve our hair loss or make things worse? And if so, is our hair affected differently for exercises like cardio or weightlifting or high intensity interval training? Well, a new 2021 study suggests the answer is yes. And if you're hitting the gym and worried about what impact that might have on our hair, this video dives into the details, the study, the science, our take on the data, and even a weekly workout modification for people losing their hair and looking to use this new information to their advantage. That's all coming up. This is Rob from Perfect Hair Health, and in this video, we're gonna dive into the topic of exercise. Does it impact hair loss? Now, every week I get messages about this exact question. Some people will claim that exercise raises testosterone and that testosterone causes hair loss and so exercising must hurt our hair. Other people will say that exercise reduces stress levels which lowers cortisol and therefore exercise might help our hair loss. Well, believe it or not, both of these statements are simultaneously right and wrong. It just depends on the additional context provided. For example, some studies show that exercise can actually raise and lower testosterone. It just depends on how many minutes have passed between the exercise efforts and when we decided to sample our blood. The same is true with cortisol. We see similar time dependent effects across a variety of hormones. Then there's the fact that hair loss can come in a range of types and thereby causes. So some exercises might hurt some types of hair loss but have no impact on others. Take somebody who's crash dieting, who's deficient in protein and has hair loss related to hypothyroidism. For that person, 60 minutes of daily cardio, well, that's probably gonna dramatically exacerbate their hair shedding because the calorie deficit and the hypothyroidism are going to worsen. Simultaneously though, for somebody who's fit, who's healthy, but maybe losing their hair to something like androgenic alopecia, well, those same exercise efforts are probably not gonna lead to dramatic increases to hair fall. In fact, this 2021 study suggests that these types of exercises, they might even help this type of hair loss, which we're gonna get into in a minute, but you can see just how complicated this is and why context when we're talking about these things is so important before jumping into any new treatment plan revisions. On that note, if you are fighting hair loss, feeling overwhelmed, and maybe want some help, feel free to sign up for our email course. It's written by me, a medical editor and study author with five peer-reviewed publications about androgenic alopecia. We'll dive into the science behind hair loss, the problem with one-size-fits-all solutions, approaches for hair regrowth with and without the drug model, and their evidence, and also how to effectively navigate the sea of treatment options so that you can stop wasting time, wasting money, and wasting hair. All right, so back to this 2021 study, the relationship between exercise and the severity of androgenic alopecia. It's a study out of China, and while the abstract is in English, the rest of the study is not. So I had it translated, and if you'd like to read either version, you can find them in the links below. But the study sought to answer one interesting question. In the absence of hair loss treatments, does exercise influence how fast androgenic alopecia will progress? To answer this question, the investigators recruited 592 men and women who'd been diagnosed with androgenic alopecia in specific medical centers the prior year. None of these people sought any hair loss treatments for at least six months. All of them were in good health, and all of them were diagnosed with just androgenic alopecia, not other types of hair loss disorders. That's important because androgenic alopecia is one of the world's most common hair loss disorders. It's chronic, it's progressive, it's mainly driven by a combination of male hormones and genetics, and you really can't walk down a city block without spotting somebody with the condition. Six months after this initial appointment, the research team sent each subject a survey to collect information over their exercise habits ever since their diagnosis. How often they were exercising, how long, and the kinds of exercise they were doing on a weekly basis, be it cardio, high intensity interval training, weightlifting, sprints, yoga, stretching, even leisure activities. Then, using photographic assessments from the initial appointment and the six month follow up window, the investigators and the subjects assessed the changes to their androgenic alopecia progression. They used one of the following markers aggravation, natural progression, or improvement. So what were the results of the study? Well, at face value, they weren't too impressive. Overall, 9% of subjects saw aggravation of hair loss, 76% saw natural progression, and only 15% saw hair improvements. And 
Before I go on, we have to keep in mind that if we surveyed 600 random people with androgenic alopecia, regardless of their lifestyle habits, this would be a very standard distribution for how androgenic alopecia might progress over a six month window. We know this because long term studies show that men with androgenic alopecia lose on average 5% hair volume per year. What people don't realize is that the speed of progression per person can vary wildly. Some people, it seems, can go bald in what seems like five years, while for others, the process seemingly stops and without explanation. For instance, a long-term study on finasteride found that men in the placebo group saw, on average, worsening of their hair every single year. But fascinatingly, 20% of these men taking a sugar pill after five years still maintained their same head of hair despite zero treatment. Again, while hundreds of us might average out to a 5% loss in hair volume per year, some of us are going to lose 30% of our hair, while others, we're not going to lose anything at all. And when you pair these fluctuations with things like seasonal-based changes to our hair cycle, which can affect hair density, it's expected in any given six month window that a few people are gonna report hair improvements, a few people are gonna report worsening of their hair loss, but most people are just going to report that typical natural progression, some slight thinning that is barely cosmetically perceptible but still progressing. Again, this is expected, it's not unique. So what happened next? Well, the investigators decided to stratify this data based on exercise habits. Specifically, they took the results of these hair loss outcomes and then they controlled for factors like exercise type, exercise duration, and exercise frequency. And this is where things began to become a lot more interesting. The first finding was that the investigators discovered a positive correlation between improvements to androgenic alopecia and the frequency and duration of exercise. The more exercise, the more likely somebody was to report hair improvements. But not all exercise had the same impact. Those doing aerobic exercises, things like cardio training, jogging, swimming, these individuals saw a 5.4 fold greater degree of hair improvements versus those who were just doing leisurely activities. In fact, subjects exercising more than 60 minutes per workout saw better improvements than those who were doing 30 minutes of effort or less per workout. And finally, exercise in the form of sprinting, weight training, high intensity interval training, these things were not associated with any hair improvements. That's not to say that they still aren't helpful because 46% of subjects who exercised at all reported improvements to their impression and anxiety. It's just to say that the effects seem to be different on hair loss related outcomes depending on the exercise type. So long story short, when we stratify these data by exercise type, frequency, and duration, we start to get some interesting findings. Regular cardio exercise of greater than 60 minutes per workout seems to correlate with hair improvements, and more so than other exercise types. So the next question is, what might explain these effects? Well, the investigators presented two hypotheses. First, that longer aerobic efforts might improve circulation to the peripheries, and since many regions of balding scalps are hypoxic, or lacking in blood and oxygen, this might improve blood, oxygen, and nutrient transport to miniaturizing hair follicles, maybe even helping to lengthen their hair cycles. Second, they suggested that longer exercise durations, well, they might drive down levels of testosterone and its metabolites, specifically DHT, which is causally linked to pattern hair loss. They even cited research showing that while testosterone levels can increase during periods of exercise, they can decrease thereafter and even drop below baseline when exercise stops. We've actually seen similar effects like this on marathon runners, people who tend to have testosterone levels that are lower than their sedentary counterparts yet are still incredibly healthy and fit. So two interesting explanations. What are my thoughts on this study? Should we all start jogging for two hours daily? Is exercise an effective treatment for androgenic alopecia? And do these proposed mechanisms actually make any sense? Well, first, it goes without saying that studies like this, cross-sectional survey studies, they're not the gold standard designs for 
investigations into androgenic alopecia. In other words, we're not looking at a randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled study, which means that we can only discern association of exercise patterns on hair loss outcomes. We can't discern causation. Moreover, a study like this one, while it's certainly helpful in many respects, it lacks objective endpoints. Photographic assessments are great for discerning hair changes in some contexts, but hair counts and hair diameters with a photo trichogram, that'd go a long way to confirming the improvements we're perceiving and making sure that they're actually reality. And lastly, it's worth noting that this study, it does not necessarily agree with all other studies done on exercise and its relationship to hair loss. For instance, this 2017 study found the exact opposite results, that people who exercised more were actually more likely to be losing their hair to androgenic alopecia. And while there are confounding variables here, for instance, if you are losing hair, you might be more inclined to work out because you want to improve your appearance, we need to recognize that there are some limitations in these data sets before we totally revamp our exercise routines in hopes of improving our hair counts. Now, with those disclaimers, I personally believe that there's still merit to this study, mainly because there's already so much research out there showing how certain lifestyle habits might have an impact on the acceleration of pattern hair loss. For instance, this study found that smoking cigarettes was associated with increased severities of androgenic alopecia in a time and intensity dependent manner, even after controlling for other habits and demographic data. This study on 13,000 men in South Korea found that men who worked greater than 52 hours per week were more likely to seek prescriptions for hair loss treatments than those working 40 hours or less. And that's even after controlling for income, working conditions, and other lifestyle habits. And these studies on genetically identical twins showed that androgenic alopecia can accelerate faster in one twin versus the other despite them having the same exact genes, and that those accelerations associated with lifestyle choices like smoking and stressful events that correlate to things like telogen effluvium. So it's not unreasonable to assume that positive lifestyle choices like regular aerobic exercise might have some effect on slowing down the rate at which androgenic alopecia might progress. In my opinion, I think that that's what this study is showing. Better lifestyle choices might confer with a slower onset of androgenic alopecia. Now, to be clear, I am not saying that aerobic exercise is a treatment for pattern hair loss. I know some loud personalities on the internet will likely miss the nuance of what I'm saying here or try to claim as though words like accelerate are synonymous with the word cause. They are not. So to be absolutely clear, working out is not a frontline therapeutic for any hair loss disorder. We also know that there are professional athletes who work out for hours each day and get great cardio and yet still can go bald at young ages. There are also type 2 diabetics who live completely sedentary lifestyles and are overweight and yet have nearly full heads of hair. So this relationship, it doesn't hold up at the extremes. What I am saying is that as an accelerator, certain lifestyle choices, for instance, the absence of regular aerobic exercise, well, these choices might act as negative contributors to the balding process. And if we believe the results of this study to be true, the question then becomes, what might explain them? Again, these researchers hypothesize that long duration aerobic exercises may increase circulation to balding regions and perhaps even have a suppressive effect on testosterone, like we see in marathon runners, both of which might improve hair loss. And that that might be true. It could also be true that aerobic exercise improves insulin sensitivity and with better insulin regulation, we see testosterone normalization across a variety of tissues and organs, including the scalp and hair follicles, maybe reductions to cortisol levels, better regulation of our hair cycle and thereby reductions to hair shedding. So we can make many arguments from both an androgenic perspective and a hair cycling perspective. And while all these hypotheses are plausible, at least in my eyes, we still don't know the exact mechanisms behind these findings or if they're even replicable in larger, better controlled studies. And that's fine because the data here are, of course, preliminary and this is how science starts. So if these results are real, how do we incorporate these findings into our exercise routines? Well, the first thing to realize is that in this study, there weren't any exercises that appeared to worsen hair loss outcomes. So don't feel like you need to start canceling your HIIT workouts or your weightlifting sessions, or that you have to substitute these efforts for things like long bouts of cardio. Instead, 
you might want to consider adding in two or more light 60 minute aerobic efforts into your weekly workout routine. Consider going swimming, going jogging, doing things that get your heart pumping, but that don't leave you breathless or exhausted. A good gauge might be to exercise hard enough to start sweating, but not so hard that you can't maintain a conversation with the person next to you. That's really it. Move more, enjoy yourself, and enjoy the fact that you're making these changes not necessarily for hair health, but for better health span, improved long longevity, improved happiness, resilience to stress, lower levels of anxiety. That will make the efforts a lot more fun, a lot less daunting, and something that you actually look forward to doing. And that's it. I hope the information helps. Thank you for watching. In the next video, we're going to dive into one of my favorite case studies ever on hair loss subjects, specifically how a burn victim with pattern baldness accidentally regrew their entire juvenile hairline, and how this one accident and case report changed what we thought was possible for recoveries from androgenic alopecia forever. That's next week. Take care.